Good evening, citizens and my colleagues on City Council. We now call our public work session to order. And Madam Deputy Clerk, would you read the roll, please? Vice Mayor Barnes. Here. Mr. Battle. Here. Mrs. Lucasburg. Here. Mr. Moody. Here. Dr. Whitaker. Mr. Woodard. Here. Mayor Glover. Here. Madam City Manager. Twelve, twelve point oh nine. That's going to be presented by interim city attorney Stromberg. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council members. Uh, some time ago, a couple meetings ago, I believe you all asked us to, or my office, to look into revising Section twelve point oh nine of the city charter, which involves the recall of elective officers. Uh, we presented language to you that aligned more with the state code. And the only question remaining was um, the percent that's required uh, on the petition, the percent of, senior, uh, percent of voters that it's required uh, uh, to file a petition. Right now, the charter reads 30% of the electors of the city voting for governor in the last preceding gubernatorial election, 30%. Um, there was a question, I believe, at uh, a prior work session as to whether that percentage uh, could be uh, uh, increased and whether there are any parameters on that. We researched the law and found that uh, the law is silent on that. It could be any percentage you all require and direct us to do, we'll be happy to do. I'm looking for some type of uh, consent tonight to let us know. That's the last remaining item if you all do want to proceed with this charter revision. Uh, once we get that percentage nailed down, we would come back if you all want us to and uh, schedule a public hearing uh, and then submit it to our legislative delegation to take to Richmond. About the only uh, constraint we, we could see is don't forget that uh, this legislature has to approve it. And so if, if, if it's maybe an extremely high figure or an extremely low figure, they may not approve it. That, that's the only constraint we, we found. So I would just like to find out uh, if there's some type of consensus as to what that percentage uh, should be in order to file a petition uh, to recall elective officers in the city of Portsmouth. Thank you, Mr. Attorney. Um, my colleagues on council, uh, we have an uh, open discussion. So does anybody want to uh, start the discussion? Vice Mayor Barnes, you have the floor, sir. I think we should um, move as far as the percent to to wait on it, but since the person who brought it up is not here. Does anyone else have anything to add to the discussion? Um, I do. Um, yeah, I, I can agree with um, the person, um, Councilman Whitaker, Dr. Whitaker brought the uh, subject matter up, but um, how it is in the Virginia law or the charter, how it is set forth currently, I believe that the 30%, if we're gonna go forward with any change to it at all, I mean, that would be su sufficient, um, the 30%, so that we don't get outside of the approval of having to change anything at all. Thank you, ma'am. Council Member Woodard. Council Member Moody. No Council Member Battle. Um, Doctor Doctor thought behind the the change was that the entire mass of the city vote to elect a person, and it was kind of unfair if you got. 10% of the voters or 5% of the voters to come back and do a recall and can successfully um, uh, bring a person out of the uh, council seat uh, like that. Therefore, he was wanted to elevate it, elevate the numbers. And I agree with um, Ms. Burke, 30%. Um, it's what the state does, and 
I agree that we stay within those parameters and not go outside of them. If I could make a, a comment. Actually, the state system is 10 percent of the number of voters who voted in the last council election. So it's 10 percent of that, whereas our city charter ties it to the last gubernatorial election and makes it 30 percent of the last gubernatorial election. I worked some numbers from the last election in the memo I forwarded to you all, and it, it, it came out pretty close. It was uh, one way was 8,000 voters were required, the other was 10,000. But right now, our charter reached 30 percent of the uh, voters in Portsmouth who voted in the last gubernatorial election is where it is right now. It, it sounds like we don't have a clear consensus right now on that. Well, well hold on a second. Um, so. I would like to speak to that, and I'm fine with the language that is, as it is today. I'm fine with the 30 percent as it is today. Okay, and as far as the uh, language changes we made that brought it closer to the state code, or, uh, we had a consensus on that before, I believe. Is that right? That had certain grounds before you could recall somebody? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, so but I think the percentage amount we do – Based on what I've heard here today, it seems like 30 percent um, is the consensus amount on the recall. And can I get a show of hands of to that effect, please? Okay. All right. So we'll, we'll uh, get it ready and bring it back for a public hearing sometime in September. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. my commitment to competitive wages for all employees. I support a collaborative and integrated approach between employees and city leadership. In my role, it is my responsibility to be a good fiscal steward of the city's financial resources. To that matter, I will call Chief Financial Officer Mimi Terry and Derek Challenger, I guess Derek Challenger is going first, um, to provide the status of where we are. Derek is an, an assistant city attorney in our office. Yes. Attorney Challenger, how are you, sir? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of the City Council. Um, today we're doing a, uh, a repeat discussion on collective bargaining. We came back uh, maybe a month ago. Next slide. Collective bar bargaining is a process whereby employers recognize unions um, as representatives of uh, employees as it relates to salaries, working conditions, benefits, and other aspects of workers' compensation and rights for workers. Uh, the interests of employees are commonly uh, presented by representatives of a union in which the employee uh, belongs. That's just the definition of uh, collective bargaining. Now I'm going to go through a history of public sector labor relations in Virginia. Uh, Virginia law has always prohibited public employees from striking. Virginia law was silent for many, many years about whether public employees had a right to organize and join unions. Uh, the, the right of public employee to join, join unions was first addressed by the Supreme Court of Virginia in 1935 when the court denied Norfolk firefighters' right to join a union. Uh, by the early 1970s, there was at least 19 local governing bodies within Virginia operating under collective bargaining agreements, which primarily was fire and school employees. In 1977, the Supreme Court of Virginia and Commonwealth of Virginia versus County Board of Arlington County outlawed public collective bargaining agreements in Virginia. Uh, now in May of 2021, uh, the state of Virginia has given municipalities the right to recognize collective bargaining. In the Hampton Roads area, there are no public sector collective bargaining uh, agreement that's been allowed. There's been no city or, or municipality that has allowed collective bargaining to go forward. Um, 
and there is no known prior history of public collective bargaining in Portsmouth at all. Mimi Ture will con continue with the presentation. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council Members, Madam City Manager, Administration, and Citizens of Portsmouth. My name is Mimi Terry, and I'm here to present my portion of the collective bargaining presentation. What are the overall impacts of incorporating collective bargaining relative to conducting city business? Impacts. There are no requirement for collective bargaining to be an external contract, meaning that both sides in the negotiation may request shorter or longer contracts based on what is requested. It is a contract which provides binding results to all parties, which means you can't elect to change the rules once a collective bargaining agreement governs the workplace. Each party is bound by the policies and procedures included in the contract. There are no guarantees found in a collective bargaining agreement, which means some contracts require no productivity requirements from their workers, making it a challenge to discipline workers who don't produce regularly. In some cases, some may feel like they have the direct, they do not have to take direction or have to work with the organization leaders, such as chiefs, department heads, or supervisors. Collective bargaining changes and increases the cost of doing business. Typically, it increases the cost of doing business instead of using the same resources to conduct business and provide needed services for our citizens. Fair representation is not always part of the collective bargaining process. As some seem to put it, it creates a divider between the have and the have nots. The have nots still won't have. It also creates a division within a division, oftentimes someone not being represented. Collective bargaining requires workers to redirect performance of mission critical duties. Focus is redirected from the meeting the critical needs of the city and not providing core services due to, the t due to the time spent negotiating contracts. It precludes management's ability to address systemic issues surrounding the workplace. It doesn't ensure equity. Equity, equal pay doesn't mean equity. What are the current employee initiatives that the city is currently taking? Classification and pay plan has been updated as of July 1. Council did increase wages. Uh, we went to $11 for minimum wage. Council did elect to do that ahead of schedule based on federal government requirements, which were January 1 of 2022. Addressing equal pay for all, all employees across the city. We're addressing equal pay equity, so we're not identifying just one group, it's across the city. Pay compression and performance measures are being currently done. We are providing annual general wage increases, offering competitive wages and a competitive benefit package, investing in the improvement of employee work conditions, developing coherent strategies surrounding diversity, equity, inclusion, and employee morale. Administration is currently working with public safety associations to address employee concerns. The city can achieve the same goal by continuing down the path that we are on to include fairness, equity, and diversity for all employees. Administration is working with department heads 
where opportunities are based on qualifications, skills, not favoritism. We want to be able to attract and maintain the best and the brightest, not tenure and leverage. How will, oh, sorry. How will collective bargaining affect the budget? Primarily, we have costs associated, uh, costs associated which include increased salaries and benefits of unionized contract workers or employees, creation of new positions for administering and designing the program, salary and benefits of designated staff positions, compensation for contractual services, including legal advisors, preliminary estimate range of two million annually does not include pay increases relative to new union contracts for employees. So those costs are outside of any new costs that would be associated with pay, benefits, anything in addition to what they are asking for or what anybody would ask for. So two million is just off the top annually and then everything else comes behind it. Recommendations instead of collective bargaining. Improve communications and equity among employees. Administration is doing a deep dive into all issues concerning the workforce. Collective bargaining is not needed. Develop an action plan to include, but not limited to, policy changes, pay compression, organizational structure, workplace condition. The city already has a formal approach to address salaries and benefits, as well as work conditions that can be achieved by working with our human resource department management group, along with our city administration. Collective bargaining is not needed or necessary. There is no need for Portsmouth to be the front runner on collective bargaining. Portsmouth does not have the fiscal capacity for collective bargaining. Portsmouth has a variety of needs and our resources could be better utilized to address the needs within our city while continuing to invest in all of our employees, not just one group, to make Portsmouth a top tier city. This concludes my portion of the presentation. I'm open to entertain any questions you may have or I can defer to the city manager or turn this over to the mayor. Thank you, Ms. Terry. Are there any questions from my colleagues? Um, Councilwoman Lucas Burke, ma'am, you have the floor. Ms. Terry, could you remain up here, please? Yes. Just in case we have some questions. Okay, thank you for the presentation, Ms. Terry, and Mr. Challenger, uh, I guess, um, we were waiting to get to a point where we could hear something and be able to present to um, the citizens on this because um, we all went into this year um, and I believe it was a work study group that was formed um, to come up with some scenarios or some, some presentations or some information that they could present back to us and citizens on, on their findings. So are all of these, I mean, with the estimated range of the $2 million, is this a compilation of what the work group came up with, or? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. um, we actually had two different work groups. Okay. We had one work group that consisted of human resources, union, uh, and the city attorney's office. And then the second group, which was after our last meeting, which was for uh, with involving chief financial officer, myself, the city manager, um, and that $2 million was a result of both of those processes as well as considering uh, what this, uh, Alexandria and Arlington, which are the only two counties in the state of Virginia mm -hmm. that has allowed for collective bargaining, it's using their information as well as Loudoun County, County which is in the, on the, on the uh, brink of allowing it as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, all those various forms were used to determine that as well as our own needs with the city of Portsmouth. Okay. And let me just say, and, and just to, not pick right, but just to uh, 
in that. So fin fiscally, we know that we are not even in that umbrella mm -hmm. of Arlington mm -hmm. and those uh, lucrative counties that in which he just described. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of want to make sure that we're clear on that. Right. And the $2 million, I guess that would be the salaries for the legal um, persons and whoever would be handling the cases that would come through, or or is this just an, an estimate of what we think? Uh, what does it entail? What does the two mean? So some of the things that are included, um, there's a labor administrator. Right. Um, that person's salary. There are five or six um, staff positions. Uh, we estimated two in the city attorney's office, two in uh, finance, and two in human resources. Okay. Uh, legal uh, uh, retainers that have people who have specialized knowledge as relate to collective bargaining, um, to do the order the leg work as relate to collective bargaining agreements um, and the negotiations that go along with it. Um, so all those various components. Um, and the other thing I would like to add too that I don't know if we, we, we have, I don't believe we talked about is the possibility of impact to the bond rating. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That is one of the considerations that the bond uh, reviewers use um, to determine borrowing uh, ability is whether or not you're constrained by a collective bargaining agreement. Okay. And so that fund would come out of the general fund if it were to be implemented and it would be every year going forward. Okay. Are there any other questions from my colleagues on council? So then I, I have a couple of questions. The first question is, I heard you indicate in the work group, you brought several parties together. What was that like? Because the reason why I'm prefacing this question, I've heard in the past uh, from certain, certain groups in, in, in the city that there was an unwillingness of management, city leadership, particularly this manager's office to really engage you know, certain groups in the process, right? And so my, my understanding is we are engaging, we are involved, uh, we are working collaboratively to get to a good place. I will say this before you answer it. After, well, go ahead and answer that. What are we doing together to get to that place where we can build the trust, we can articulate what the needs are for the organization, as well as the entire city. Because as we all know, it's not just a one-sided deal here. So please help me understand that. The first uh, work group consisted of the fire department and their union, um, as well as a outside person who had helped them with that process. Um, so we had five meetings pretty much every month from I believe maybe the end of November 20, 2020 until about April of 2021. And we met about five times in that period. The fire department and the city. And the reason why the fire department was involved, um, they're um, one of the most uh, prominent unions that the city has. Mm -hmm. um, and they uh, reached out to me and wanted to become a part of the work group and their involvement was, in, was very helpful. Um, it was a very collaborative process um, and their, their help was very greatly needed and, 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 and appreciated. Um, so yes, it, it was a collaborative process and in the course of this whole process, we've met with you know, other stakeholders as well as it relates to the city moving forward. So I think that it has been a collaborative process. Okay. And, and based on that process, do you, do, in the engagement, do you feel like everyone had a say in, in the process? Was everybody at the table? Did, was there consensus reached on any issues or ways forward? There, there were some consensus. We actually um, uh, worked uh, a, a lot towards actually creating a agreement, actually. Um, and, but one thing I would like to say as a, as a preface is the fire department has been the only 
department that has stepped forward as having an interest in collective bargaining. Um, there's been no one from general city employees or the police department that, that, has, that has expressed any interest with respect to collective bargaining at all. So it's really only been the fire department. And, 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 and one other question I do have, and this is for the manager, you know, based on, on your experience and what, what you've been discussing with, with the fire department union members and whatnot, I mean, what is the staff recommendation? Um, the staff recommendation is to not move forward with collective bargaining. We are always open to trying to meet the demands of our employees and ensure they have competitive wages, ensure they have good working conditions, opportunity for training, and we're, we've been in discussion. And we're moving forward with those recommendations that the fire, not only the fire department has approached the city about, but also the police department. We understand what those challenges are. Those challenges exist across the organization. So we're not in a vacuum, operating in a vacuum and not wanting to sit down and try to reach uh, an agreeable position. And that, as I said that in my discussions with both police and fire union representatives, we are open. We want to maintain competitive wages. We want to be able to retain the best and the brightest. So it's not our position to be in opposition or to not be willing to collaborate. This does not move us into th that direction. As I said to them, this would put us in a defensive position. We're no longer going to be working to collaborate on how we move forward. The city will take a defensive posture to save the city resources. That's not the position that I want to be in, but I am here to ensure equity across the organization. Thank you, ma'am. Councilman Battle, sir, you have the floor. I'd like to just make a long story short. It doesn't make sense for us to invest $2 million that we can be using to tackle some of the problems that we have just so uh, uh, some folk could have a collective bargaining agreement situation. That somewhat puts uh, the same foot in their mouth in reference to getting raises. So in essence, to me, this doesn't make sense and I will not be voting for anything like this. Thank you. Council Member Woodard, sir, you have the floor. And this is for the city manager as well. Um, so how is, I, I know you sat at the table with the police force and um, also the firefighters. Um, how is communication and the uh, conditions for our firefighters? Sorry, I had to get this mic thing straight. For firefighters, um, we're pretty competitive. Uh, we have not lost uh, a significant number of firefighters to other jurisdictions because of pay issues that I'm aware of. Um, two years ago, the city approved, I think, additional 17 positions um, that we have filled most, if not all of those positions. We've lost six positions due to retirements. Um, so we have, I think, a vacancy of nine or 10 positions in fire, given the 17 that was uh, added additionally right prior to the pandemic. So for, for a fire perspective, I think we are extremely competitive. As was mentioned by uh, Mr. Kirk Dietrich uh, of the fire union, he said, in this jurisdiction, our firefighters are the only ones who have two turnout uniforms. So that goes a long way to show that the city has been trying to meet those demands within the resources the city has. And we're going to continue to do that. We discuss pay compression. Pay compression exists throughout the organization. The challenge of it is to define how we measure pay and how we reward pay and have it not just be based on time and tenure because time and tenure necessarily does not equate to value. And that is a problem throughout the organization. You have people that are coming into the organization that because of increases that the council has made or general wage increases has increased the beginning um, base level salary. And those that have been here for years 
the only mechanism to get a well, way to get an uh, increase is through a general wage increase or through a promotion or a reclass. And if that does not occur, then you find yourself having pay compression with people that are coming into the organization brand new. And one likes to equate time with value. And that is not always the case. If you have employees that are not continuously uh, educating themselves on current demands, on uh, ensuring that they have uh, credentials, uh, uh, additional certifications, what have you, relative to the job, that does not necessarily mean that that person who may have 10 years is going to give you more value than that person coming in with one. Thank you, city manager. Thank you, ma'am. Vice Mayor Barnes, you have the floor, sir. I have a real brief statement. Um, the city manager um, just said, talked about how um, time doesn't mean value. That's always one, been one of the arguments that I've always had when it comes to a lot of things, because a lot of us seem to think that time and experience means value. I have a. Thank you, sir. Is there someone else that has a question? Uh, Ms. Terry, did my, you have a comment? Yes, sir. My only comment is that I just want to make sure that everybody understands that this is not the entire fire department that petitioned, that there are two associations within the fire department, and that I didn't want us to believe that every firefighter was supporting this, because that would not be a true statement. Mr. Battle, sir, you have the floor. May I be as remedial as I can be? <laughs> for the sake of understanding. If we're gonna spend $2 million and not give anybody a raise, it doesn't make sense. And at the same time, we don't know what other expenses will be incurred. So this doesn't benefit the fire department, either of those different factors, the police department, and it puts a heavy burden on our administration, the city, the city manager. So I hope I've, uh, you know, made it very, very clear. This does not make sense. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Battle. And I, before you all sit down, I do have one one comment that I would like to make, and this is the mayor's comment. This is not on behalf of the council. When we were presented with the collective bargaining opportunity, uh, we, as a council, I know that I supported collective bargaining in principle. After the process had started and we received much more information, the questions that I asked to not only myself as, as an elected leader, and this is not political for me, this is about fairness mm -hmm. and equitable treatment across the board. At the end of the day, the voters will ultimately decide what their preference is. But for me, it's about fairness and equity. And the questions I've asked to our firefighters who we appreciate and we have mm -hmm. the utmost respect for, and I've dealt with them in good faith. The questions that I always had, can we improve the relationship with our management team? Can we be better? Because to me, you go to a collective bargaining situation because something is broken down. And you want to ensure beyond any reasonable challenge that you are going to get from a contractual standpoint what you signed up for. In my estimation, and I'm not talking about the past. I can't speak to the past. I can only speak to the future. But I reiterate that we, we respect and we appreciate what our firefighters have done, and we support them. Make no mistake about that, 100%. But at this time, understanding the financial impact, we're coming out of a pandemic. There are a lot of question marks we still have. From my vantage point, I don't believe this is the right time. Now, I'm not suggesting it may never be the right time, 
but this time we have more growth that can take place, more relationship building that can take place, more dealing with the issues in terms of the pay compression that can take place, workforce environment that can take place and shall take place. Would you agree with that, Madam City, City Manager? Wholeheartedly. So where I sit today, and I know as I said I supported it initially, I want to move forward in the spirit of collaboration, of relationship building, of shoring up all of those things. And then at the end of the day, if we failed to get to where we need to be after we've put the processes and policies in place, then I think it's time to revisit that. Correct. That's just my two cents. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to ask my colleagues at this time, based on what we've heard and with the staff recommendation, um, is there a consensus to move forward with collective bargaining or without collective bargaining? So I'll ask the question, is there a consensus to move forward without collective bargaining? Can I get a show of hands? I have one, one other question, though, about, um, so just where we were, um, the resolution that we passed last year was just to go forward to look into it. Information. And then the resolution that we passed in May was to continue work on that. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead, sir. You have the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Ms. Terry, uh, Mr. Challenger. I just wanted to know, um, I, I know we were saying that Alexandria was uh, probably the closest city who was already practicing collective bargaining. Um, through your groups that you guys uh, created, your task force, whatnot, for this particular uh, uh, topic, was there any other neighboring cities who were close to making this happen? No. No. Uh, the, oh, the only cities that have either established collective bargaining or close to establishing were all in Northern Virginia. Uh, Alexandria and No Arlington, talks about it, no, no, no talks. It, it, Norfolk, Studies or anything. Uh, Norfolk, I know, has been talking about it, but they're nowhere near having even a vote on it, but they have some discussions about it. Um, but the other cities in, in, in the Hampton Roads area haven't even brought it up to discussion. So thank, thank, thank you both. And I think one more time is, is there, do we have a consensus to move forward in the present, in the present uh, process that we're moving towards with the collaboration, with continuing to build the relationship uh, with the organization to create the policies and also look at the pay compression issues and being fair and equitable in how we're gonna go forward. So the question is, are we okay with that and moving forward without collective bargaining? Once again, I just need a show of hands that we're, we're, we're not moving forward with collective bargaining. Okay. We have a consensus. Thank you. Madam, Madam City Manager. The next. The next um, agenda item is discussion regarding the council retreat. At the last public work session, I was asked to bring this back for discussion to determine if the council wanted to move forward with a retreat. And so I sent out a packet of information regarding retreats. And so I am looking for the direction of council as to where we want to go with a retreat. Thank you, ma'am. So now the floor is open. Um, lady and gentlemen, um, do we want to discuss the, the opportunity to have a retreat? Is that something that we're considering? Council Member Vice Mayor Barnes, you have the floor. Well, my, my only concern or question would be what are we going to be doing <coughs> on the retreat? Are we going to be discussing pertinent issues? or we're just going together to, to, to see if we can manage to get along. Mm -mm. 
Well, I think the agenda, if you had taken a look at the agenda, there were some, some targeted discussions that we were going to have. This wasn't a team building and a, and a you love me, I love you meeting. This was really dealing with the issues and figuring out how we can approach them and coming out with one voice on moving forward. So that's, that's my understanding. What do, you, what do you mean by moving forward, one voice? Well, one voice meaning that when, when we have a particular issue, we want to make sure at least everyone understands what that issue is and how it impacts our citizens. But more importantly, we need to have some consensus, one voice, a direction so that we can give to our city manager and others so that they can carry out our wishes. So basically what we do in the meeting, discussing the issues and getting consensus, and that's true. is that what you mean by the one voice? Well, 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 basically, as it was explained in the document, there are specific issues. I'll give you one specific issue in, in, in just as an example, um, dealing with the way that we handle um, our budget going forward and what things are important in our budget, we will have that discussion and what can come out of that is at least a clear consensus on what things are the priorities as a group so we don't have to continue having that discussion. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Councilwoman Lucas Burke, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I believe that we would be, it would be a, to our advantage to um, continue with a retreat. Um, good information comes out of a retreat and it shows um, that we are uh, one body. Um, I think in my four, first four years on the council, um, we've had a retreat every year, and this is the first year that we seem to be just agenda items off the cuff, and that's not how we want to be. We want the remainder of this year to show us as a uniform uh, body. I mean, it's not going to be that we all come together and agree on one thing, but I think we will benefit from having some extra time other than the two hours we get for um, a public work session or a special call meeting. I think that devoted time will um, be a refresher and opportunity for us to, to step back and to look at the things that the city manager had laid out in the um, agenda um, that she sent, the, in the letter that she sent us. I think we would be benefited from a retreat. So um, if it's the pleasure of council, I would move that we, you know, once we are able to vote on that, that we would continue to move as um, one body in a retreat. Thank you, ma'am. Council Member Moody, sir, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. I, I brought up the subject at the last uh, meeting. I've been to a couple of retreats. Uh, I say that in jest. Uh, I've never been to a retreat that I didn't feel was productive. Also, a retreat uh, gives a roadmap for progress that we can uh, put on the board, we can post it. The public, uh, it's for public uh, edification. People wanna know what, what is council doing? What are your priorities? A and we can point to, okay, these are the six ba big things. I think at the uh, retreat a couple years ago it was the four big things. Mm -hmm. And uh, that quantifies what this council is doing on behalf of the the citizens and what we're doing to make this a better place to live, work, and play. Uh, it also allows uh, uh, council to uh, uh, hear from department heads uh, on uh, uh, where they feel uh, uh, you know our city should be going relative to what they do, whether it's parks and rec or leisure services. Uh, whomever, uh, legal department, you, you name it. Uh, but uh, I think it's important that the public uh, ha has a roadmap. Uh, you know, they elect us to, to make the city a better place to live, work, and play. And I think uh, a retreat uh, defines that, uh, gives the public something that they can quantify it with uh, when, when they come here to uh, uh, before council. If, if we said we're going to do one, two, three, or four things, uh, by golly, they, it's a report card. We, we should report back 
and I've always been a stickler of this, you go to retreat, and after that, uh, we need uh, to issue a report card to the citizenry on, okay, these are the things we said we were gonna do. Okay, here's the progress or lack thereof, uh, but uh, I think that's what makes uh, retreat uh, valuable myself, and obviously I support uh, continuing that. Councilman Battle, sir, you have the floor. Uh, let me um, say that I support a retreat, but now I've gone to one retreat, and one thing I remember from that retreat is um, I had uh, mentioned some figures uh, to be checked that would bring our police department up to the seven, second highest paid police department in the area. And um, <laughs> we, we haven't gotten to that yet, and that's been a couple of years. But a retreat can be good, and I have no problems with the retreat. Uh, the only problem that I might pose or might be posed to me <laughs> is going in the bushes <laughs> for a retreat. I, I'm a city guy, and I don't want to go out there with the bears and the squirrels. I love nature. I, you know, go to parks and things from time to time. But if I'm going to do a retreat, I want to do it in a confines of a city. Thank you. C Councilman Battle, if, if I may add to that, sir, um, I hear you. And I certainly understand. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, thank you. I think that we have a consensus to, to move forward in that way uh, based on the responses. And are, are, are you okay with that? I am, and I am, and I will work with the city clerk to come back with options for the retreat based on what I've heard today. It's, it appears that um, one of the items you would like coming out of the retreat is to identify priorities. Yes. And the other thing that I heard coming out was to not have it in the woods. Yeah. Yes. So I think I think I can work with that, and uh, we'll come back um, with uh, recommendations with how long you want to be in a retreat, um, whether you want it for a day, a day and a half, a half a day, um, overnight. So. All of that, um, we will be making some recommendations um, to you at the next time we can discuss this item. The, also, the timing. When when do you want the retreat is, is another question. Thank you, ma'am. Are, are we okay with looking at the fall time, ladies and gentlemen? Okay. I think the fall, fall time, perhaps maybe October, time frame might be good it, it doesn't have to be a week and they're going to present options of whether we want typically I know we have done a a arrive an overnight we generally will arrive um, in the evening stay overnight start our process in the evening on a Friday and go all day during Saturday and and end on a Saturday afternoon so that everyone can get back home in time to enjoy uh, their Saturday. If I may add, if you have specific recommendations that you would like for us to include in the proposal, please do not hesitate to send them to myself and the city clerk so we can capture that and make sure that we include it in the, in the proposals that we're going to present. Thank you, sir. We have now come to s council liaison reports. Council member We'll go in order. Uh, Vice Mayor Barnes. Nothing to report. Council Member Battle. Uh, the Prentice Park area did the uh, paper pickup thing this weekend. Uh, big turnout. We got an awful lot of uh, work done. The place looked much better. And they are considering um, having them bi-weekly or I mean by, by month by monthly or 
twice a month, uh, whichever, you know. But uh, they're going to continue with that. And they did make some requests that I'll discuss with uh, Mr. Manager, I mean, Ms. Manager, and uh, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, sir, and thank you for uh, pitching in out in the community. Also, uh, Councilwoman Lucas Burke. Thank you, Mayor. Um, did have the meeting with the Hampton Roads Regional Jail uh, Authority last week. Um, a ton of information, um, some things that uh, we're not able to discuss um, because of the nature of the closed session matters. Um, but they did have a meeting with uh, the city managers and they are all coming together uh, to determine what uh, steps we need to move forward um, as an authority. Um, there is a hearing um, regarding the decertification um, as well. Um, so once we're able to provide more information on that, um, we will give that to you. I think it's probably uh, been announced in the media um, that this, the Hampton Roads Regional Jail is appealing the decertification. And so uh, once we have more information, we'll provide that. Also, my uh, the, with the Stop Inc. Um, uh, board, um, they will be coming up with a virtual uh, golf tournament um, in September, and I'll provide more information. Um, maybe we can put it out um, in an email blast so persons who are golfers um, who would like to participate in that can get involved um, to help stop um, Inc. Um, agency stay um, in line with what they're doing. That's all. Thank you, ma'am. Council Member Moody. Thank you, Mayor. I attended uh, uh, two meetings this week. Uh, one was this morning, actually, the PPIC or the Portsmouth Port and Industrial Commission. Uh, under new business, they're um, similar to the EDA. They formed an ad hoc committee to come up with an incentive program to uh, uh, come up with a, a system where they could award uh, uh, grants. And also there was an uh, issue with uh, some property maintenance at uh, uh, Burton Station uh, 3920 uh, that was discussed. Uh, also, there's a joint uh, EDA PPIC retreat uh, coming up uh, September the 28th. And uh, there was also a report back on a successful uh, hiring event that uh, occurred recent, recently. And also attended the uh, uh, Historic Preservation Commission uh, meeting uh, last Tuesday. Uh, a couple items, there was uh, approval on a, uh, on a renovation at, uh, I think it was 250 Florida Avenue. Also a fence uh, application was approved with uh, some uh, uh, modifications. And uh, also uh, uh, demolition uh, uh, request uh, was actually uh, uh, submitted, uh, but uh, uh, there was not a, enough information to make a decision on it. That's got him. Thank you, Mr. Moody. Council Member Wooder. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, I actually attended uh, the Parking Authority uh, meeting and there are plans to actually revamp the uh, Middle Street Garage. Uh, matter of fact, attorney, interim attorney Stromborough was there as well. Um, it's, it's a lot of ingenuity that, that they're putting into this new garage is actually smaller with more parking spaces. So that'll be great for the city. And it also will free up some space that the city will actually gain a parcel. So um, it'll be something that uh, will actually complement the new garage and we possibly can look at some new development. Uh, you know, just, just hypothetically could be an apartment complex that could uh, complement this new um, parking garage. So, um, and it, it, it has a lot of unique designs that complement Old Town as well. So I'm excited about it. Uh, a lot of the people on the, the parking authority was excited about it as well. And I'm looking forward to uh, seeing those plans come by the council for uh, consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Woodard. Um, last Thursday, I had the opportunity to present 
before the Hampton Roads delegation, um, remind them of our resolution on the tolls, and most importantly, to ask for their help in reducing the toll costs, particularly on the citizens of Portsmouth and generally on the region. I can tell you all of the statewide delegation was there um, and the chairman, Senator Lionel Spruill, after I presented our position, uh, was very congratulatory and he also indicated in his conversation that we know that the state has about a $2 billion surplus at a minimum. It could potentially be more than that, but just understanding that there's a $2 billion surplus at the state level and understanding the financial impact to our citizens and our businesses of the increase in tunnel tolls and how it hampers our ability to move and grow, um, we did get a commitment in principle as the General Assembly reconvenes in August for their special session. There will be a consideration on the table for reducing the tolls um, on the people of Portsmouth and the Hampton Roads region. I don't know what that is right now in terms of the dollar amount. We will be having a follow-up conversation with Senator Spruill and other stakeholders. I talked to the, the former state finance, finance person and state transportation leader, Mr. Aubrey Lane. And so folks are understanding what we are dealing with in the city of Portsmouth in our, and in our region. We must continue to advocate, right, and take this forward. But I think in no time in our state is the opportunity right for the state to take ownership in helping us to buy down these tolls. And so we're gonna continue with that. Stay tuned. Our legislative person, Sherry Neal, is going to be uh, bringing that forward as well. So we'll go up during the special session and be sitting in the room to see exactly what will happen in regards to that matter as it relates to Portsmouth and the region. So thank you all for your time. And assuming there's no more business uh, in the work session, this concludes the work session.